This is lecture number 14 on the angels, part one. First, I guess we could have guessed there were angels, even if the Bible didn't tell us and we hadn't seen any. Two, we are body, soul beings, and animals are body beings. Why not soul beings to round things out? Three, we are above the animals because we have souls. Angels must be above us because they have only souls. Angels are souls without a drag. And a number of scripture references that I'll read in a moment. Four, we could also guess angels sinned. We sinned in our souls. Why wouldn't they who are only souls, or at least possibly? Five, it was necessary, it was unnecessary for them to sin, just as it was unnecessary for man to sin. They were the original sinners. Six, angels have no appetite for fruit, but being creatures, they desired some kind of apple. Seven, but the soul which tested them, since they were no, there were no serpents yet, must have been God himself. Eight, it must have been their pride that had to be fed. Anything forbidden would have raised the slumbering serpent in their own bosom. Nine, somehow it must have been leaked in heaven that the Son of God was going to take a creature's nature. And it was not to be an angel's, but that of inferior man. Ten, what a blow for the angels, but not so great as the one to follow. They, the superior angels, were to serve these baser men. The Son of God, passing the superior creatures by, was to be incarnate in the virgin's body, and the angels were to be ministering servants of all this, Hebrews 1.14. Proud angels were not about to tolerate this humiliation. As I say, I think we could have guessed, for the reason I've given in number two, that there were, or at least could have been, angels, even if the Bible hadn't told us about it. It's pure speculation on my part, but we do recognize in this lower world of ours that there are human creatures and there are other living creatures who do not have souls as we have. They're our ministering servants. We have dominion over the creatures, but we are like these inferior creatures in having a body, but unlike them in having a soul. So it could very well occur to a reflective individual that there could be an order of being which was merely a soul that had no body at all and would presumably be superior to us who had this drag of a body. The body is, after all, a drag on the soul. It slows us up. It makes us uh, take time to eat and to get medicine for our various ailments and such things as that. And generally speaking, the greatest thinkers among men have usually found the body to be a hindrance to pure thought and in a certain sense, therefore, somewhat inferior to a being who was pure soul or mind, as it were. And that seems to have been the nature of the angels. But we do learn from number three, we are above the angels because we have souls, and angels must be above us because they have only souls. Angels are souls without a body drag, and we get a picture of them in these passages I mentioned. Perhaps the fullest description of them is in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, which I might read. In the year of King Isaiah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim, a higher order of angels, stood 
above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You see, the prime role of faithful angels is the adoration of God. And it's quite possible that apart from Christ, we would never begin to see the excellency of God to the degree that angels understand him. And they would be even more naturally attracted to be lost in wonder and awe than the inferior intelligences of human beings. At any rate, we see these lofty beings who in the presence of themselves holy beings, but in the presence of God could only cover their faces with confusion and cry out, holy, holy, holy. Just as I said in that, mentioned the other lecture there, you know, even Jesus disavows in his human nature goodness. Goodness, 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 you point to God. In the same way the holy angels, they disavow their own holiness and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. In Matthew 1, 20, we have another reference to them. But when he had considered and beheld and behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins." That's an illustration of the thing that the Hebrews passage indicated, that the angels are ministering servants of our salvation. And when our Savior comes on the scene, they are not only there to salute him and sing the great hallelujahs of his birth, but in these later episodes in his life, as this one where Joseph, you remember, had thought that she had been unfaithful to her vows, and was told by the angel she had not been, that this was conceived by the Holy Ghost himself, a supernatural birth. That was made known to Joseph, who was then directed in what he should do by uh, angels. Now in Acts 5.19, we have a, another reference. I'll read a couple verses before so you get the entrance of the angel on the scene. But the high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is, the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. And they laid hands on the apostles and put them in public jail. But an angel of the Lord during the night opened the gates of the prison, and taking them out, he said, Go your way, stand and speak to the people in the temple, the whole message of this life. So they're cheerleaders, you see, of the apostles. They're reminding them, even as they deliver them by their supernatural power, keep doing what you're doing, what brought you into this particular prison, declare it to everybody, the whole counsel of God. They're the originally orthodox who are constantly moving the people of God in this world to continue in their fidelity to the truth of God. 730 in the book of Acts tells us this, that after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him, Moses, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. Now, we know from later uh, revelations here that this angel is the angel of the covenant and is no other than the Lord Jesus Christ in a pre-incarnate manifestation of himself. But he takes the form of an angel, almost indicating the fact that the angels were messengers of God and communicators of revelation, and therefore they are to learn from what is being revealed at the 
burning bush. Acts 10.3 reads, About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw a vision, an angel of God who had just come into him and said to him, Cornelius, this Gentile leader of a band of a hundred Roman soldiers, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze upon him, and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now dispatch some men to Joppa, and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a certain tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who was speaking to him had departed, he summoned two of his servants, and so on. Now here Cornelius calls the angel Lord, but it wouldn't mean necessarily that this was the Lord himself, but that he was a Lord to Cornelius, and he recognized, Cornelius did, that he should obey whatever was revealed to him by this angel. And here again you see a very strategic juncture in the history of redemption, where the redemption is going now to the Gentile people, beginning with Cornelius, and it's announced by none other than an angel of God. Acts 23, 9 has another reference to an angel, which is worth observing in this uh, context here. And there arose a great uproar, and some of the scribes of the Pharisee party stood up and began to argue heatedly, saying, We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. So the Jews, who were represented by this speech, were aware of angels and recognized that angels were heavenly messengers and were even speculating whether it could have been a good angel who revealed these truths which the Apostle Paul was uttering that had chagrined his, uh, his Jewish friends so much. The last reference I'll read here is from the ninth chapter of Jude, which tells us how the angels fell and some of them became devils. Verse 9, But Michael the archangel when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. That's the that's ninth verse where we see that even a fallen angel had a certain kind of respect by Michael in this contest for the body of Moses, so that he dare not denounce him, but could only invoke God to uh, rebuke him. But in verse 6, a little earlier, how this devil and how all the other angels came into this fallen condition from the glorious state in which they were created came about is explained. An angel, says Jude in verse 6, who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So these angels who were created first, exalted beings, spending most of their time in the adoration of the all-worthy God, also fell because they left their original place. That doesn't explain to us what that is, that original place of theirs, or exactly what it was that was tantamount to their leaving the place in which they were created. But we are told clearly that they were created upright, just as man was, and they departed from the place, the situation, the condition, the job, presumably, which they had, and therefore were cast down into hell and kept in bonds until the final judgment day. They're under judgment now, but the final day, which they still shrink, is something yet actually to be. So we realize that 
the fall of the angels came about by some departure from their duty. And we speculate, you see, since the Bible doesn't say in so many words what that was, had to be likely in connection with the messianic advent in human nature. And the adding insult to injury by making the angels who were bypassed actually perform the role of servants to these inferior human creatures. Now that was their appointed place. They were to be ministering servants of God's chosen human creatures. And because they left their place, which I assume must mean they refused to obey what they were commanded and to do what their duty was to carry out that for which they had been created, they were cast down into hell. Looking out these propositions, if you will, number four, we could also guess angels sinned. We sinned in our souls. Why wouldn't they who are only souls? I don't mean to say we could be sure about it, but we know from our own history that though our succumbing to temptation was in connection with the eating of an animal, uh, eating of a fruit. What that fruit was, we don't know. It's certainly never said to be an apple, though that's a tradition and so on. But the point is it was a forbidden fruit and it apparently a fruit that looked good and could taste good and so on. But it was out of bounds for us and that brought us our fall. And we could realize if some such temptation could come to us by means of something we desired, and we could actually be deceived as Eve was into thinking because it looked good and might taste good and so on, that it was good to obey God, that we were damned, that angels being rational, temptable beings, just as we are, could very well, even though of a higher order of being, succumb to temptation. But all our speculation is set to rest because the Bible says specifically that is what they did do. They departed from their place. They refused to obey God when he appointed them the ministering servants of our salvation. Five, it was unnecessary for them to sin, just as it was unnecessary for man to sin. They were the original sinners. I say this just for the simple point that we wrestle probably more than any, uh, with any more any other argument with how man could sin since he was altogether holy. Books have been written on this and very little satisfactory explanation has ever been given of it, but you do recognize when you study the angel, the prior question is how could angels sin? And it would seem to be even more difficult to answer that question because they didn't have a body and they couldn't be tempted by anything that was an appeal to the flesh as human beings. But they were above all that type of thing and yet they were capable of sinning. They were pasa pakara, pasa non pakara, able to sin or able not to sin and they did actually sin. Now really when you're wrestling with this question, strictly speaking, this is the first question. The fundamental question is how can a good, moral, rational creature sin? But as I said with respect to man, I think the only relief on that question would apply to angels. Angels are created beings. As such, they can fall away. They could fall away into non-being, as we said in our creation lecture. God prevents that by constantly recreating them. They could fall away into moral non-being, and God didn't prevent that with either angel or man. But man was lost forever without any redemption. I mean, the angels, but Man, when he perished and died the day he ate that forbidden fruit, nevertheless God opened up a fountain in the Savior's blood by which he could be redeemed, a privilege never offered to any angel whatever. But I just notice here in passing 
that these are the creatures who first raise the question how a good creature can sin and in a more acute form than human sin because they were first and also because they were superior. Number seven, uh, six uh, here, angels have no appetite for fruit, but being creatures, they desired some kind of apple. And apparently, if we can sort of read between the lines, Lucifer, a leader of the angels, found the apple in pride. He was the greatest of all the creatures. He was the greatest creature God has ever made. I mean, if an angel is superior to a human being, and he was a superior angel to all other angels, and so on, Lucifer must have been the greatest creature God ever made, even greater than the human nature of Jesus Christ, because it is still just a human nature, which would be of a lower order than the angelic nature. But nevertheless, they must have had something which tempted them, and likely, precisely because of their greatness, it would be pride, especially when they are asked to serve the inferior creature. You know Milton's statement that they would prefer to reign in hell and serve in heaven. I always wonder about a thing like that. The devil doesn't get any joy out of reigning in hell. He ought to have known that. The angels are often called, the fallen angels are often called his angels. He's the boss of the spiritual underworld. He really controls them, but it gives him no satisfaction because there is no satisfaction under the judgment of God. He goes on with that particular role, but there's no relief for his misery and his pain which probably was greater even than that of man. But the soul seven which tested them, the angels, since there were no serpents yet, must have been God himself. So we don't have the type of probation to which the angels were subjected, but that they were subjected to some sort of trial that the angels, which are now called angels and are clearly established as angels forever, had to undergo before they were established in an unfallable condition. We assume that it must have had something to do with pride and not this, and this is your job, and they wouldn't accept it. They moved out of their place. They wanted to dominate man rather than serve him and so on, but in wanting to dominate man, they were also wanting to dominate God because God was the one who told them what they were to do, and they were not about uh, to do it. And presumably, see, many people think that the origin of sin in man was likely pride. But it seems to me with angels, it's almost certain it was pride. We don't know, but somehow or other, they must have been tempted. They succumbed to that temptation, and they were lost forever. The moment we succumbed, we died, as the Scripture said, but Life came to us where sin abounded, grace did yet more abound, but where sin abounded in the angels, not grace abounded more, but wrath abounded more. Nine, somehow it must have been leaked in heaven that the Son of God was going to take a creature's nature, and it was not to be an angel's, but that of inferior man. You see, here again, we don't have any story about that. The Bible's a book about man. It goes into quite a good deal of detail about how we were first created and the probation we underwent and what happened and how we came to fall and how we were rejected from the garden of communion with God. But none of that is said about the angels. But we know one thing. They must have been created upright. A good God can't create a bad man. He can't create a bad angel. Some of them are established in uprightness, we know, and some of them are fallen from uprightness, we know. So we are sure of the fact that something was a temptation, and we conclude, since they were made the ministering servants of man, since that was assigned to them, 
And since they realize something, however vaguely, about the redemptive purpose God had for men, that presumably is what caused their downfall. So you see, in a certain sense, Christ was the occasion for the downfall of the angels, just as truly as he was the occasion for the redemption of many lost men. Finally, 10, what a blow for the angels, but not so great as the one to follow. They, the superior angels, were to serve these baser men. The Son of God, passing the superior creatures by, was to be incarnate in the virgin's body, and the angels were to be ministering servants of all this. Proud angels were not about to tolerate this humiliation. Now, as I say, when we talk about the angels, how they are made, and how they could sin, and so on, we learn that in a sense, their temptation was even severer than ours. We know that something about that tree of the knowledge of good and evil was attractive, even though it was forbidden, and we realize how this speaking serpent, the devil taking a serpentine form and cuddling up to Eve and trying to gain her confidence with a message that the reason for God's forbidding you to eat of this forbidden tree was that he was afraid you would become like him, able to know good and evil. Now, that was a temptation which was too much for Eve, but you can see that wouldn't begin to be the humiliating thing that provoked the angels. Theirs was a direct challenge to their supremacy. And this angel who had supremacy even over the angels would be of most angels, and all angels the most provoked, the most tempted to disobey God, most inclined to move from the place in which he was actually created, and so he did. So, our friends, I will continue the study of the angels in the next uh, lecture also. It's good for us to know that these heavenly beings, even though some of them were lost because of their refusal to join in our salvation, that the other of them, the host of angels who are now praising the living God, have been created and preserved in divine providence for the salvation of God's human creatures in Christ Jesus.